Take your seats. This evening we have a, a talk uh, entitled Coin Chemistry and Surface Reactions by our own Elliot Hertz. Hertzenberg. Hertzenberg. And, uh, okay, thank you. Watch that cord, Elliot. Yeah, well, uh, I, I won't go there again. Um, I have an anniversary to announce. A year ago at the March meeting, Susan and I attended our first Wilmington Coin Club. And so, big anniversary. What makes it more, it makes it more laughable is that Ginny and I live down Dardell, one block away from here. And we've been living in our house for over 40 years, and we had no idea that the Wilmington Coin Club was meeting here. So when we found out, we said, we got to go, we got to go, since we are interested in coin. We all know that newly minted coins are going to change their appearance, sometimes rapidly, within months, sometimes within a year or two, sometimes over 50, 100, 200 years. There are three major reasons these surfaces change. First is mechanical erosion, and by that I mean, let's say you have a bunch of coins in your pocket, you jiggle them around, what happens? The details of the coins start wearing down. Secondly is grime, just bulk dirt on the coin. I'll use these as examples. There's no grime on these coins, these ancient coins. But you can imagine that some of the uh, details of the coin, the, the uplifted parts of the coin, are going to gather some grime. And then finally, the third major reason for surface change is chemical reactions with gases or liquids or solids that are in the environment. That's the subject of what we're going to talk about tonight, is the chemical changes on the surfaces of the coins. Before we get to that, though, I want each of you to think to yourself, it's not a question of raising hands or anything, ask yourself, why am I, meaning yourself, why am I interested in collecting coins? Why was I interested a long time ago? Why am I interested now? And how does the various broad fields of study relate to the interest in coins? And on the next slide, I've got the answer. Anyway, think for a minute for yourself. And here are some of the broad fields of study that I came up with. Some of you may be interested in economics, and you got into coin collecting as a subset of economics or art or history, or politics, language, geography, metallurgy, and then finally on the bottom there, chemistry. So anyway, think about that for a second. The chemistry is an interest of mine, and this is a, Susan and my way of showing my bio biography of sorts. I'm an inorganic chemist by education, by career, and then a university science educator after my chemistry career ended. So I've been collecting coins for a long time, originally U.S. coins, and then more recently Susan and I got involved in world coins. Okay, before we go into the coin chemistry itself, I'm assuming that many of you have not had exposure to chemistry recently. <laughs> Everybody raise their hand that's in that ballpark. <laughs> oh, you've all, ah, there you go. So what I want to do is introduce to you some chemistry basics that will uh, allow you to understand the actual chemical reactions that we're going to see near the end of this presentation. So let's do some chemistry basics. Now, let's go to language for a second before we go to the slide that's presently up there. 
In the English language, we have 26 characters or letters, and they're in a distinct order, A, B, C, all the way out to, to Z. In the chemistry world, we have something fairly similar to that. There's a distinct order of the chemical elements that exist. All told, there's about 115 known elements, and they're all listed here, and we'll get into some of them, certainly, in the next few <coughs> slides. But right now, this is the periodic table, and there's a distinct order to this table, as you can see. And in each of the um, elements in the box here, we have what's called an atomic number, and it goes from 1 to a 118, and there's a symbol, there's a name first, the name of the element, and then there's a symbol, which is usually an abbreviation of the particular name. Some of the symbols will be abbreviations from an English or English language name of the element, and some are from other countries. I'll mention a few of those in a few minutes. So anyway, we got this periodic table and some other key points on it. Each of the columns, there's 18 columns total. They're called groups or families. And that will come into play in a few minutes as well. So there are 18 of these columns. Our atomic number one, the first element, almost you know, the equivalent of A in our English language, is hydrogen, with the obvious abbreviated symbol H. Each of these symbols is either a one-letter or a two-letter symbol. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the colors in the backgrounds of these elements. These, these colors are a little different than what was on my computer, so I'm going to have to <laughs> uh, change over here. The lilac color over here, yellow, the paler yellow, almost none of the... the Sorry. One, the, yellow, uh, light yellow colors all the way across, and the tannish colors or light brown colors over here. Those are all metals. And I know your, your head is whirring right now, and you're thinking, God, look at all those metals. And you're thinking, how many metals are there really in all the coins that we, we're interested in and, and collecting? So you have metals. The blue over in the Right-hand side, those are called semiconductor elements. They have some metal properties and they have some non-metal properties. And then the lilacs over on the far right side are all um, <coughs> what we call non-metals. So the metals far outnumber, large majority, far outnumber the, the, the metals outnumber the non-metals. Okay, let's say what, how many of these elements are useful in minting coins, and we'll show this in the next slide. Okay, there are only seven metals that I know of. If somebody has another one, talk to me. But these are the seven metals out of that large majority of metals that are useful for minting coins. Reason, economics, availability, Properties, both appearance and reactivity, or lack of it, you want for a coinage metal. So let's take a look at these metals very, very briefly. Copper is the preeminent metal for coinage. <coughs> it's got the symbol CU, and you might say, well, where'd that U come from? The Latin name cuprum is why copper has got the symbol CU. Silver is next, and AG, not even close to silver. Argentum, the Latin name Argentum, where AG came from. Aluminum becomes obvious. Zinc is obvious with respect to the, the full name and, and the symbol. Iron is obviously non obvious. And the Latin name ferrum is why we use the symbol FE. Nickel, Ni, so obvious. Gold, Latin name Aurum, is why the 
a U symbol is used. Now, a little aside from the surface reactions of coinage metals, I listed here the densities of the various coinage metals. And you'll notice that large majority are within the density range of 7 up to about 10 and a half to 11. And there are two outliers. One is aluminum, very light, versus the density of water, which is 1.0 grams per cubic centimeter. You have uh, aluminum at 2.7. How many of you picked up an aluminum coin? If you're a world coin collector and you think, God, that's awfully light feeling. This is why. <laughs> OK? And then the other outlier on the other end is gold. For those of you that are, collect gold coins, you say, wow, this, for the same size coin, this gold coin seems a lot denser than does the, the other coins that have majority of these metals in them. So that's an aside on the, the chemistry part of it, but I just wanted to share this with you. Okay, the next slide is the periodic table again. And I want to show the seven elements. There we go. Here's where the seven elements from our previous slide are shown. Here's the, excuse me, getting in the way here, but iron, nickel, copper, zinc, aluminum, silver, and gold. <coughs> what I want to emphasize over here is that copper, silver, and gold are all part of the same family. Copper is the little brother, silver is the medium-sized brother, and gold is the big sister. Got to put in a, gen a gender change over there to make everybody happy. <laughs> but anyway, they're all the coinage me metals are all in the same family. Now we need to talk about some of the elements that are going to react with these metals, <coughs> and they're listed in uh, or highlighted in the yellow over on the right side of the slide there is carbon, oxygen, sulfur, and chlorine. And we'll see them in action a little bit later in the actual chemical reactions. There's two others that I want to mention. One I've already mentioned, hydrogen, and then there's another one, Na, or sodium. In sodium, Na is the, from the Latin name natrium. So, those are the, the main actors, if you will, or reactors in either element or uh, compound form that are going to react with our metals. Okay, a few more definitions and factoids in the chemistry basics. First is many older coins and modern coins as well are minted as alloys. What is an alloy? It's a mixture, a homogeneous mixture of two or more metals. And homogeneous meaning there, you cannot pick out domains of one metal versus the other. They're just microscopically mixed together. And the reason you make alloys is greater strength, resistance to corrosion, becomes important, of course, for coins, and in many cases, appearance as well. Okay, some examples. Older U.S. five cent pieces. I don't want to call them nickels because you know, we do call them nickels, but I want to use the cents terms over here. The alloy that's used to make our older five cent pieces are, is an alloy called copper nickel. And 75% copper, 25% nickel. And the U.S. Mint has been using that for a long time until recently. The older silver coins are 90% silver and 10% copper. And for a while, the U.S. cents, 62 to 82 in the 1900s, were made out of 90% copper, 5% zinc, what we call brass. Some of the older cents, back in the earlier part of the 1900s, were made out of bronze. The difference between bronze and brass is bronze has tin as well as copper and zinc, and brass does not have any tin. So I didn't even mention tin as one of our metals. It's always present in very small percentages. 
modern coin constructions may be more complex, and I was just talking with Bob LaBelle before, showing that Kennedy half dollar, which is sort of splitting apart. Sometimes you have coins that are uh, plated, they have a bulk composition, and then they're plated with some different metal or another. A couple good examples of U.S. coins are uh, the current U.S. cents, those bright shiny coppers there, copper plated zinc. And some of the older guys, and we'll revisit the 1943 so-called steel penny. We'll revisit that a little bit later. But um, that is zinc-plated steel. Copper was at a premium during the middle of World War II. The U.S. needed it more than they needed steel. So uh, for that one year, the 43s were made out of uh, zinc-plated steel. They were called steel pennies. Now also, the bulk of a coin may be iron-containing or nickel-containing. And the reason for that is the magnetic properties. Nickel has another reason as well. Iron really doesn't, other than it's relatively inexpensive to, to use. But the magnetic properties give you compatibility with today's vending machine operations. And the vending machines use sorters for, of types for optics, magnetism, and uh, density, and they use obviously to separate coins. Okay? One last slide on the introduction to chemistry. A couple definitions of molecule. What is a molecule? It's a combination of two or more atoms, or those two or more elements, that held together these atoms by a chemical won't go into that, but trust me, there are chemical bonds, and there's a distinct spatial or geometric arrangement. And a good example is water. H2O, I think we all as lay people know the term H2O. The spatial arrangement looks something like this. The oxygen in the middle and hydrogen on either end, and actually there's an angle, it's about this type of an angle where the oxygen is here and the hydrogens would be at at the end of my fingers yeah, as a representation. Now also, the air that we breathe has about 21% oxygen in it, and you can see the formula for oxygen. The subscript 2 in both water and oxygen tell you that there are two of those atoms in the molecule. And finally, chemical compound, and I fit this definition for our audience here. A chemical compound is a pure chemical substance, and it's a larger mass of identical uh, molecules in so-called bulk quantities. So those are the chemical compound definitions that we'll work with. Okay, finally, let's get to chemistry of coins. Now, we have the metals. We've already described them, the seven metals that I mentioned. Now we have what I'm calling the bad reactors, <laughs> okay? And there are, I'll mention them in the next slide, we'll show where they come from. But first of all is water. It's a universal solvent for us, as we all know. And I'll go sort of counterclockwise <coughs> on this. Carbon dioxide, <coughs> hydrogen ions, which are the basis of acids, and this one reaction over here is carbon dioxide plus water gives you some hydrogen ions, of those positively charged hydrogens, which are acidic and, and corrosive in many cases, plus the carbonate ion. We'll re revisit this type of reaction in a little while. Hydrogen sulfide on the bottom, H2S. Oxygen, which we just discussed, and finally, uh oh, <laughs> we're missing a, we're missing somebody up there. Uh, no, 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 hydrogen chloride is the first bullet. Somehow it disappeared. Okay, hydrochloric acid in uh, liquid form, you know, dissolved in water, or hydrogen chloride as a gas, and then finally our old friend, sodium chloride, which we know as table salt. Okay, so those are the bad reactors. 
Now, public enemy number one among the bad reactors is that little caricature over on the right-hand side over there. Now, I'll bet you never saw a water that looked like that, did you? <laughs> okay? Water is uh, you know, either humidity or liquid water, but especially humidity over time is a real poison to the uh, stability of a nice newly minted coin sur uh, uh, surface. And it also enhances the rate of reaction of many of these other bad reactors that we're going to talk about. Water, of course, is a good guy in all other applications other than when you drown in it, but uh, for coins, for coins, it, it's public entity number one. Oxygen, we already discussed, 21% concentration of, of all the gases that are, are in the air that we breathe. One source of acid that we'll mention here, I was talking to a couple members several months ago, cheap older coin flips were made out of polyvinyl chloride. And in doing so, no one knew at the time, but the polyvinyl chloride is a fairly stable polymer, but it does have trace amounts of hydrogen chloride and, and or chlorine in it, depending on the manufacturing method. And when those two chemicals are released, you end up with an acid and the acid then can start reacting with the surface of the coin. Carbon dioxide is the next to the bad reactors. It's a gas in air. It's present at about four hundredths of a percent. And those of you that are interested in climate change, global warming, you may hear the term. There's 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in air. Another way to express that number is 0.04 percent. Okay, hydrogen sulfide is poison to several of the metals. We'll see that when we do the reactions in a few minutes here. Okay, hydrogen sulfide is present in much smaller quantities than than the uh, carbon dioxide. Where does hydrogen sulfide come from? It comes from decaying plant matter. It comes from industrial processes, sulfur being released, or sulfur compounds degrading to, to hydrogen sulfide. It's actually a relative of water when you think about it, H2O versus H2S. Oxygen and sulfur are in the same family. But anyway, it's present in small quantities, but as we know, and we'll see with, with silver, it does a quote, a job on the nice shiny surface of a, of a nice clean <coughs> silver coin. Human handling also provides acids or provides oils, and the oils can slowly interact with metal surfaces and start corroding the metal surface as well. And then finally, salt. The salt can come from anywhere. Your pocket change on the kitchen table when you're using a salt, salt shaker on another part of the table for your food and comes from spray uh, near salt water bodies is another possible source of salt getting onto coins. Okay, next. Okay, let's talk about some of the reactions of the seven metals on coin surfaces. Now we're getting to the, the meat of it. This, this is what the subject is all about. A couple of points I want to make before we talk about the specific reactions. First of all, I've written the word names of the chemical entities that are involved in the reaction. And then from a chemist's perspective, I've shown the chemical formulas. These are the so-called equations. And what is an equation? It's almost like a sentence in our English language, or any language actually. You have some nouns, and you have some verbs, and you may have some more nouns, and you may have some adjectives. 
So the nouns would be the chemical elements or the chemical compounds. The adjectives might be the, the so-called coefficients. And I put these coefficients in there for chemical purists that want to see a, a so-called balanced equation. If you do a count of the, each of the element types on each side of the equation, on the acid <coughs> side, the arrow is a yields or a becomes, um, trans, transforms to whatever verb you want to use. So the arrow is the verb in the language analogy. And then on the right-hand side is the uh, product. Product or products. Here, product. Later on, we'll see products in plural. But anyway, we have copper plus oxygen from the air. <laughs> yields cuprous oxide. What I've shown on the right-hand side, and you'll see this on all the succeeding slides, the left-hand side of the photo part of the slide shows fairly clean coins, not clean in the sense of you know, that, not to mention word cleaning of coins, but just uh, fairly new coins or, or pristine surface coins. And then on the right-hand side are the, the so-called ugly coins unlike uh, the Somali coins, which we saw over the table there. We're going to look at a bunch of really ugly coins here tonight. <laughs> so, any, well, hold on, go back. To, uh, we've got two reactions. We've got actually five reactions of copper, two slides here. The first one is copper plus oxygen. And the first compound that forms with uh, contact with oxygen and copper is a material called cuprous oxide, Cu2O. And it has a medium brown color. So you can see in this center slide over here, let me come on the other side over here now. You can see the sort of medium brown color over here. This is a fairly uh, clean looking coin. It's actually brighter than what the photograph shows here. Now the other uh, reaction, the second reaction that occurs over a longer period of time, more of this happens, is the copper reacts with oxygen to form what we call cupric oxide. And it has a darker brown color. And you can see that over here. These are all Lincoln, Lincoln Memorial, Lincoln Head, Lincoln Memorial scents. And you can see the th three different stages of um, oxidation of, of the initial copper metal surface to give us the, uh, um, call it the uh, patinaed or the um, reactant surfaces. Okay, now we have a few more copper reactions to show. Copper oxide reacts, and these are fairly complicated reactions. I tried to simplify them down. There are several reactions which may occur prior to coming to this, and there are several versions of uh, copper carbonate as well. So I'm just trying to show the most predominant one without boring you with a whole bunch of additional reactions. But anyway, if you, if you react copper oxide, cupric oxide, with sodium bicarbonate, which is formed from in an alkaline version of, of uh, uh, carbon dioxide containing environment, you get what's called basic cupric carbonate. And it has this formula over there, C, Cu2, OH2, CO3. And then sodium carbonate is, is a byproduct. And the basic cupric carbonate has this greenish color that you can see over here. These are two Canadian pennies from the 1960s. One is a fairly normal looking penny for a circulation coin of that age. And this one, we got this in one of the bulk lots that Susan and I purchased. Looked at it and we said, holy mackerel, how did these people, are they collectors or how did this come in a bulk lot with, with some other really nice looking coins? And then you got this ugly duckling over here. And look at this color. What does this remind you of in our everyday lives here in the United States? What do you think about it? It's the 
same material as the Statue of Liberty. Okay, you can see that similar color, the, 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 the original copper surface of Statue of Liberty oxidized and reacted to form uh, basic carbonate. The next reaction is cupric oxide again, and this in the presence of chloride, sodium chloride for example, and a little bit of humidity water, and you end up with basic cupric chloride now. Instead of the carbonate up top, now you got chloride on the bottom, and sodium hydroxide is, is released and, and continue the, the action. These are some Hong Kong coins from the 1960s. This one's a 1964, and fairly typical of a circulation coin of that, that age. And then from another one of our lots, this ugly duckling showed up over here. And you can see that the basic cupric chloride is also a greenish color, a little more green than the bluish green of the carbonate, but still similar, similar color, but not exactly the same, but very, very, very similar. So these are Hong Kong coins. And then finally on the bottom, copper can react with hydrogen sulfide. And in doing so, we form cupric sulfide, CUS, plus hydrogen gas, which then gets released. Okay, here's a fairly normal circulation coin, 1959 Canadian cent. And here's cupric sulfide is black, and this is much darker color than what cupric oxide is. So I assume that there's some oxide plus some sulfide present. Don't know without actually doing the analysis, but I would believe that this 1936 Canadian cent in the reverse side probably has some, some cupric sulfide involved in it. Okay, next, silver and gold coins. We have silver, reacts with hydrogen sulfide. Silver has a, an immense affinity for sulfur compounds. And hydrogen sulfide is usually the, the bad actor. Silver sulfide is formed and hydrogen gas is released. So here's some nice shiny silver coins. These are from the internet. The previous copper coins were all, were all our photographs. But anyway, um, internet photos of nice looking silver coins. And then here's some of the reacted silver coins. And if you look over here, the silver sulfide is black in color, and in bulk quantity, it's black. But in very thin films, it gives these beautiful <coughs> rainbow-type colors. And that's an optical effect. It's not the color of the bulk silver sulfide. It's an optical effect. And you get a whole rainbow of colors and you can see them in these various coins over here. But as the, the layer gets thicker and thicker, <coughs> then the, the coin turns black. This looks to me like it's a wartime Jefferson nickel, which had 40% silver in it. And it really, it, it really took up a lot of sulfur. And uh, it became you know, literally jet black on its surface. That's about the only reaction that silver will undergo. Gold, pure gold, is non-reactive. That's one of the reasons that it's so valuable. It does not tarnish and it does not corrode at all. But some of the older, now, gold coins that were minted in the U.S. were made of 90% gold and 10% copper. So any of you that have gold coins and you say, gee, they don't look like they're the the pure gold. The reason is that that 10% copper may undergo some of the reactions that we discussed in the previous couple slides. So you may see a slight change in the gold color over time. So think about that if you're a gold coin collector. No, Susan, back up a second. Okay. This is a Canadian, a 2018 Canadian that we got off of the internet, I say we, Susan got off of the internet, just added it today. 
Okay, now, I'm sorry. Okay, the next metal we want to talk about is zinc. And zinc is sort of an ugly duckling metal. It's a dull gray color. It's not often used in coins, but during World War II, during the Nazi occupation of some of the Western European countries, um, for a couple of years, zinc was used as, as the coinage metal. So zinc reacts with oxygen, that's its primary reaction, and it forms zinc oxide, ZNO. Here's a 1944 to 25 centime Belgian coin with a fairly nice surface, really a nice surface for a coin that, that old that, and from the, uh, one of the bulk lots that, that we bought these world coins from. So zinc oxide is white. Zinc can also react with hydrogen sulfide, but it doesn't do so nearly as much because there's not that much hydrogen sulfide. So the zinc oxide is the predominant reaction, but you can form zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is also white. Zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide, I'm sorry. So here you can see some of the white zinc oxide or sulfide, probably oxide, forming and the blackish color on the zinc is, is an optical effect as well. But pure zinc is much more uh, close to the appearance of the, uh, the left-hand coin. They're both 1944 coins, both Belgian coins. Okay, next is nickel. Nickel is an interesting coin, interesting metal. There's not that many pure nickel coins. Nickel under the right conditions can react with oxygen. It's fairly resistant to these type of reactions. That's why it's added to the copper to make the copper nickel type compositions as an example, which the US has done in many of its coins. So nickel will react with oxygen to form nickel oxide. Now here's a, a Dutch one gilder coin that I got from one of my trips to the Netherlands, uh, many trips that I have taken there. And uh, th this is a pure nickel. Nickel is magnetic, as I mentioned before. And my computer, one edge of my computer is magnetic. And I put this nickel, I was looking up the history of this type of a coin. I put this coin next to the computer and boom! And the coin went flying right over to the magnetic edge of the, uh, of the computer. Anyway, beautiful coin, beautiful condition. The, the photograph here doesn't do it justice, but this is the coin from our collection. And then over here on the right-hand side, I don't know what this is, but it has seen one awful life. Not sure what country, what, what denomination, but nickel oxide is this yellowish-green color. And this is what it looks like. This is an internet photo. Nickel also can react with hydrogen sulfide, but it usually doesn't in any great quantity, but it can. When it forms nickel sulfide, hydrogen is released, and nickel sulfide is black in color. So what I've shown here is a very nice Jefferson nickel, and anytime you go into your pocket or your purse and you pull out a nickel, what do you get? You get a fairly nice uniform looking uh, nickel coin. You usually don't see much corrosion or patina or anything else. This guy I got from a change when I went to the supermarket about a month and a half ago. And I thought to myself, aha, I knew at the time I'd be giving this talk. And what do we have there? This Jefferson 5 cent must have had one heck of a difficult life to become that color. That, the nickel sulfide color, but anyway, <coughs> here it is, and uh, no doubt in my mind that this is a copper nickel sulfide. It could be copper sulfide plus nickel sulfide both. Remember, copper nickel is 75 copper, 25 percent nickel. So this is both of those sulfides and are really, really uh, badly treated coins. Now, wait, no, hold on. Nickel, usually a minority in coins. I showed the pure nickel for the, the Dutch gilder. But nickel is usually a minority 
and the alloys that contain a significant amount of nickel are corrosion resistant. Hence, the, some of the older Washington uh, U.S. quarters, some of our 510 pieces that I have already mentioned made out of copper and nickel are really, they, they, they keep their appearance pretty well with respect to the, the, the chemistry on the surface. So um, nickel, good, good metal to add to the alloy. Previously we saw a zinc, copper, nickel composition coin mentioned earlier tonight, the German silver. Good example of why you would put nickel in there to keep that nice, nice surface that's not going to change on you. Okay, next slide. Okay, the last of the reaction slides are iron and aluminum. And both of these metals are, give similar type of reactions. They're, their main reactions are with oxygen. They don't react with sulfur compounds at all. So iron, Fe, reacts with oxygen, forms ferric oxide, which we know as rust. rust. Okay. Here's a 1943 penny from our collection, and its surface is a little bit pitted, but overall the zinc coating on the surface is, is fairly fairly good condition, I guess I'd say. Here's a coin that did rust pretty badly. And I don't know if you can see the reddish brown color of the rust, but if you look over here, right over here on, on this upper right edge of the coin, you can see the reddish brown color. So the zinc surface was breached in some way or another, and then humidity and or water got to the steel and started to, to rust the coin. So this, this is an ugly duckling type coin. Okay, and finally, aluminum. It reacts with oxygen the same way that um, iron does, forms aluminum oxide. And there are two coins. Aluminum oxide is a whitish color. And here's a French coin from the 1940s, a two franc coin that's in pretty nice condition. It's a nice, nice clean looking aluminum coin. But when the oxide forms and the, uh, you get a white coating on the surface of the aluminum, here's a one peseta Spanish coin and you can see it's much whiter and this is not a photographic trick. This is what the coin actually looks like. And uh, it, again, you get this white, sort of powdery, pitted look on the surface of these aluminum coins that have been uh, badly treated over their lifetime. Okay, final comments. Those are the major reactions. There are many, many other reactions that go on with these seven metals, but these are the major ones that I've reviewed here tonight. Final comments, obviously, Coins are best stored in low humidity environments, closed containers, for example, and uh, putting them in a current day manufactured flip is a good way to prevent the, these environmental chemicals from too rapidly getting to the surface of the coin. So this is a decently good way. The older polyvinyl chlorides, no, but the present polyester uh, containing flips or good flips to be using. Polyester does not interact with metals at all. Okay, now besides metals, which we've discussed tonight, there are other types of coins. There's wooden coins. We, we have not, don't have any in our collection. There are shells. And what we have had, they've gone down the tummy recently or chocolate coins <laughs> that we got for Christmas time. So I just have to mention that as a laugher. So shells, whoop, oh, shells, wood, and chocolate. Okay? And I will entertain any questions now. Oh boy. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Four questions that you raised first. Go ahead. In the back. Yes. What about the platinum and the palladium? They're very expensive metals. Platinum is non-reactive, but it's very, very expensive. <coughs> um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any platinum containing coins. Mm -hmm. the, I there think, are? Yeah, some of the yeah, bullion yeah, coins are platinum. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. $100 denomination, and the palladium came out with uh, mm -hmm. last year also. Okay. And also this year, it came out, one of the gold coins came rose gold. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. That's probably a, uh, a surface coating to give an interference effect would be my guess. Okay, I wasn't aware of platinum, but again, with you know, my, my talk tonight was focused on circulation coins. I, I'm really not into the uh, commemorative type coins. Okay, answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, there were three other hands. Okay. The uh, desirable reddish-brown finish on the Lincoln penny, is that... And some have it, some don't. Is that a result of reaction to the environment, or is there anything to do with the original composition of the coin that makes it turn redder? It's, the Lincoln coins are 95% copper, <coughs> and as I mentioned, uh, some of them, some of them are brass. The, the uh, newer ones, the, the ones that are made now, are, are copper plated zinc. You know, current day coins from 1982 on, the 62. To, 82s are brass. Prior to that, going back to the early 1900s and even back into the late 1800s, they were bronze coins. Back in the 1830s, 1820s, they were pure copper. So to answer your question, though, the, uh, the oxygen reaction with copper metal will form the, the, the cupric or the cuprous oxides in a mixture. It's not one or the other. It's no doubt a mixture, and if any sulfur gets exposed, then, uh, then you'll see uh, even darker. Do you think people expose the, the coin to chemicals to get that color, or is it just a natural occurrence? You can do it, but it's a natural occurrence. It takes years. You don't see a, coin, a newly minted coin uh, change you know, within days or weeks, or usually not months, but gee, if you're in a a high sulfur environment, the reaction will occur more rapidly than if you're in a no sulfur environment. Let's say you live in Marcus Hook, PA, and you have refineries where they're constantly emitting sulfur compounds. If you leave, leave coins out there versus here, uh, you'll, you'll see a difference. O over months and more likely years, you'll see a difference in, in the color as some sulfur gets in. But the cupric oxide has um, two coppers for one oxygen, so less oxygen going on. So it forms first. And then over time, more oxygen contacts the cupric oxide and the cuprous oxide, I'm sorry, and it gets oxidized to cupric oxide. So you can oxidize coins, uh, copper containing coins, you can heat them speed up the reaction if you do it in the right way. I don't know of anybody that would want to do that. Maybe I'm wrong. What's wrong on platinum? Maybe I'm wrong on this, but I don't think anybody seriously would want to change the, the, the surface of a copper coin. Oh. I answer? If, yeah. if, if a coin is clean, they would want to hide the cleaning by artificially colored. Yes, of course. Uh, Notice I, I didn't want to mention that dirty word cleaning in here. You never want to talk about that. But yeah, if, if you want to clean copper coins, if they're really ugly and you want to use them as circulation coins, just make a dilute solution of vinegar, has acetic acid in it, and uh, the, the, the coin will clean up fairly rapidly. Soda will do the same, Pe uh, Pepsi or Coca Cola will, will clean the, a really ugly oxided surface and give you a nice clean copper surface. But yeah, you know, as a as a collector or having collection coins, you don't want to do that with your collection coins. Um, I saw one, a couple raised hands. Ginny, I'll get to you last, but a couple okay, in the back. All right, now you got a saucer and a cup. You put water in a saucer. This is silver coins only. You get a cry silver coin and put it in there, you put aluminum foil on it, and it cleans the dirt off of it all over, overnight, naturally. What happens there? 
That's a, an electrolytic reaction. It's a contact reaction. Aluminum is more reactive than silver, and it will uh, electrolytic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Another way, and again, a no-no, but if you want to clean silver coins, you just really inexpensively just get some baking soda, make a dilute solution of baking <coughs> soda, and dunk your silver coin in that. But again, if it's not a valuable coin, but you want to make it look better, that's one way to do it. But if it's a collectible, valuable coin, you definitely don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. and then there's another thing. Now, years ago, with the large pennies, people would shellac them. Yeah. Have you ever seen that? I have, and I've, I've heard about it. I've not seen it, but the shellac then protects okay. the coin what from you these. What that is, because I was a pain, I dabbled in a lot of stuff. You get acetone in your skin and vertical. It cleans the shellac right off, melts it right off overnight. Yeah, yeah. acetone is an excellent organic solvent and will dissolve mm -hmm. shellac. The shellac in itself, if it doesn't contact any of these organic and provides a, protect, a protective coating uh, so that all these bad reactors that we've just discussed don't get to contact the surface of the coin. Well, when you see one of them, you'll see it. It'll be very noticeable. It sticks right out when you show it. Okay. No, I've never, I've mm -hmm. never seen one in person. I've seen a couple. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a... Was there one other question in the back? Okay, then. Sorry. Sometimes in older copper coin, we see a kind of glossy finish that develops. Is Do you have any idea how that might be related to some of the reactions you're familiar with? What color is this glossy finish? It's, not, it's colorless. It just, it, it's, it, it's as if someone polished the surface a little bit. But the, generally, the, it's the, the brown of circulating copper that's the color. But it just has a, a, a gloss to it that the typical circulating coin does not have. Maybe it's, maybe it's shellac. I, I don't know. I can't answer that. I mean, if, if you take an eraser and rub down a highly oxidized copper coin surface, you will, in the uh, crevices, you will, no, no, stay, stay there, Susan, stay there. Uh, in the crevices here, here, you know, any, any of those, you, you can rub off the chemical tarnish and come back to the pure copper if you, if you rub too hard, if you want to do that. Another version of cleaning that doesn't involve chemicals. But, but uh, you'll get the copper color. You won't get a, a colorless uh, coating. So I, I don't know what that is unless it's a, a shellac or some other purposely it's added a shellac. It's a patina. coating on it. Elliot, yeah. it's, a, it's a natural patina that sometimes develops on these old coins. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've not seen that. I've seen some pretty ugly, highly oxidized coins. I wonder if it's shame. from oil, just like when you rub, um, you know, the oil over time gives it a protective sheen. No, that's a very hey, desirable feature for collectors in, in lightly circulated coins to, to see that kind of gloss over the, over the brown of the coin. I've never seen or heard of that, so I'll take any other comments anybody knows about this. Okay, one last. Just yeah, to, okay. Uh, I know you wouldn't do this commercially, but with all your expertise, uh, have you ever tried to artificially tone a silver coin just to see? Lord, no. <laughs> I didn't think no. so. No, I wouldn't. But I, I bet you with your skills, you probably could make it. Well, again, I, I take that back. I did once. I had a silver coin. It wasn't a <coughs> collectible or very valuable. It was a a Kennedy half dollar, believe it or not, from before the 1964 time period. And I just wanted to see what sodium bicarbonate would do. So I did try that reaction on one coin, but that's not even part of our collection. Does that make it's you it, a bad reactor? <laughs> I, guess, I guess you could say so. So yeah, I, I did that once with a uh, silver coin, just to see what it would do with a relatively non-valuable 
you hear people taking a silver coin in a uh, Taco Bell napkin, or one of those that has a high sulfur content, and they'll put it somewhere, and then within a year, they get an artificially toned coin. I, yeah, no, I've never, I've never done that. And we're into world coins. And you know, the rest of the world doesn't send the US to the U.S. very many silver coins. So, uh, no, I, I, I've not done that with any of our U.S. coins. And I've not, not knowingly seen a tone coin. But, yeah, you could do it that way, of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Carl, back there. We'll get to my wife in a minute here. Okay. Uh, at least when ancient coins, if there are deposits on silver coins, and a lot of people refer to it as horned silver, do you think that's silver chloride, or could that be something else? What color is the? It's usually black. That would probably be silver. Silver chloride is silver chloride is white. Silver sulfide is black. So if it, if it's black, then then no, it would not be silver chloride. Mm -hmm. I don't know much more about mm -hmm. that. Okay, uh, yeah. I see some um, copper and other coins that get those black points. Somebody told me that it's from the saliva. Somebody walked in front of the, of the uh, coin and, and you know the saliva came and, and made those little black things on the coin. The saliva of the, of the saliva, yeah, hey, our bodies have Sulfur-containing proteins, the food that we eat, many of them, mustard being a high sulfur version, but other foods that we eat, uh, meats especially, have sulfur-containing compounds. So some of those compounds that could end up in your saliva, and yes, if you spit on a coin or dribble on or whatever, you know, not, not to be funny about it, but if that happens, then yes, you could enhance the reactivity of the uh, the sulfur compound with the coin. Now don't forget tonight I use hydrogen sulfide as the most prominent or prevalent example. Other sulfur compounds can also work to detach, the compounds detach their sulfur atom and then bond with the, uh, with the copper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Finally, my wife had a question. <laughs> okay, so a couple hundred years ago, when I was a teenager, <laughs> um, I had a friend that told me, you know, I used to drink Pepsi out of those greenish bottles, or, or Coke, I don't Coke. remember now. Coke would be this. And they told me, if I put a penny in there, overnight it would disappear completely. Yes, it will dissolve. There's so, enough acidity in Coca-Cola. Pepsi Cola. See, colas have phosphoric acid in them. And you will get dissolution, maybe not overnight. A tooth will dissolve overnight. So if any of you drink phosphoric acid containing sodas, especially you young guys, if you're, if you're Coke drinkers, make sure you rinse your mouth, even if you can't brush your teeth. If you can rinse with water, get rid of that acid that's on your, uh, that's in, in those stronger acidity uh, sodas, namely Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, Coke, other colas. The good stuff. The lemon-lime sodas have citric acid. It's not quite as strong an acid, but even there, you want to rinse your mouth quickly. But anyway, copper coins will be cleaned. I don't know if they'll dissolve much overnight, but they'll be cleaned in the sodas. But teeth, teeth will dissolve. The tooth will dissolve overnight drop it into uh, one of the colas. So. Okay, Any, anything else? Okay, good bunch of questions.